We are continuing our discussion on the coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic. The Orange County Economic Recovery Task Force has made recommendations for how we might be able to return to some sense of normalcy. Local attractions and other businesses have started to reopen and face masks are required in many establishments and new testing sites are opening in local hotspots. So what does all of this mean for you? Well, on this special edition of Healthy Connections, we are going to get an up to date look at where we are as a community dealing with this pandemic. Our first guest is the Economic Development Administrator for Orange County Government, Eric Ushkowitz, and he's here to give us an overview of the CARES Act funding and how it can help small businesses. Eric, thank you for joining us, and can you give us an overview of the CARES Act funding and who it's benefiting here in Orange County? Uh, absolutely. We're very excited to be able to provide funding in the amount of $10,000 grants to small businesses within Orange County. Uh, there are a number of different eligibility criteria. Uh, however, we're looking at companies anywhere from 25 employees or less. And we're really trying to focus on organizations that have not gotten funding through the federal PPP program. So the folks that maybe have gotten missed in that program and are in desperate need of help, we're looking at this as a lifeline for these companies, not only to help them maybe take care of some debt that they might have built up through the COVID pandemic, but also as they try to reimagine their business to open back up in the post COVID era, as far as safety precautions or any other uh, marketing app development they might need to do for their company to make them uh, more viable moving forward with the new world order that we're in. And as it pertains to eligibility, what are the steps that the businesses need to take? So a business, what we'd like them to do is go to the OCFL.net website under Orange Cares. And the small business program is in there and it lists out the eligibility criteria and also the documentation that's needed because that's a big issue. There are a number of documents that need to be uploaded to the portal in order for an organization to apply. So if they go to the website, they'll be able to see exactly what's there. And we even house some of those documents that they can download themselves if they don't already have them. And then they should definitely check out the frequently asked questions because those are some of the things that questions they may have based on not only eligibility, but the process in general that they can get answers to before beginning. Once they do that, they can go ahead. There's a link there for them to apply and that will take them to the application portal where they can submit an application and start the process. And how about individuals and, and also families or social service organizations? How would they access CARES, funding, CARES Act funding? So that would be a separate program. Also on the same website, you would just click the individual um, application and same process. They've got the eligibility requirements there as well, as, long as, as well as uh, frequently asked questions, even a little video tutorial on how to apply. So is the website the only place that they can find information about the CARES Act? If they want to find out more, are there other um, federal websites or any other resources for them as well? So outside of the programs that Orange County is running, there are other federal programs. If you go to the Orange County website under the COVID-19 section, there are all num a number of resources, not only for businesses, but also individuals. So if they don't qualify for Orange County specific small business and individual programs, there are other programs and links to other programs listed on the website to help support our citizens. And because of COVID-19, uh, the economic development has taken a hit here in Orange County. Anything else you'd like to add about the climate um, of business here in the county? Yes, obviously we have a, a very large tourism hospitality industry that's been hit very hard as visitation has been cut down, flights in general, people traveling to the area. Um, in, other air, in other times when we've had, uh, whether it's a, a hurricane or 9-11 or a recession, it's typically that industry that has led us out of that downfall. And then we feel like that will happen again. It's a matter of when, not a matter of if. So we're very um, optimistic about the opportunity for that industry to rebound. There are also other industries in the community that are thriving, tech-based industries, 
um, that can help overcome and mitigate some of the issues due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'd say that uh, Central Florida and Orange County, they were hit very hard by this, as has the rest of the country. Um, but I think we'll be quick to rebound and we're looking as, a, as an organization and as a department to put programs in place moving forward that'll help our companies uh, come out of this stronger and better and safer. Well, Eric, thank you for being with us today and uh, shedding light on how we can find some help in this uh, COVID-19 era. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll be right back with more. Stay with us. Let's get an update from our local medical professionals. And joining me is Charles Letizia. He's an epidemiologist with the Florida Department of Health in Orange County. Charles, thanks for being with us. We are hearing about a spike in numbers, in coronavirus numbers here in Orange County. What's behind the increase? Well, there's been an increase of testing um, throughout the state and also here locally within Orange County. So. It's expected that we do see an increase in our positivity um, with that increased testing, but it's important to note that um, our overall positivity rate in Orange County is 3.1%. Uh, so as we're increasing testing and increasing access to that testing, uh, we do expect to see those in some increased um, cases, but again, the overall positivity rate has um, remained at about 3.1%. Also, do you think that people have become complacent when it comes to social distancing and mask wearing? Is that something we still need to be vigilant about? Certainly, uh, people in the community should continue um, with those universal precautions. Um, even as the state reopens, it is still important to recognize that um, COVID-19 still remains um, a concern for the public and um, people should continue um, with those precautions, including social distancing, um, using face coverings while out in public spaces, um, increased hand hygiene, and also cleaning and disinfecting surfaces. And you mentioned the testing centers. Who should get tested? Since there are more people getting tested, which is a good thing, who should really make that a priority? Anyone who believes that they might be at risk for COVID-19, um, if they're exhibiting symptoms, certainly that's an indication for testing. Uh, those that are within the healthcare community are, of course, are also um, people that we want to focus on getting tested. And as well as anyone who's in a vulnerable population, such as the um, over 65 population and anyone with a chronic health condition. And when you talk about uh, dealing with people who may have been exposed, um, what is it, the, the contact tracing, what is, what is it uh, about and, and how does contact tracing help us to sort of stem the curb of, of infections? So contact tracing is an, a really important tool that we've used in public health for years um, where we interview um, cases that we know to be positive and we try to ascertain um, their, their steps and their history of, you know, their timeline as far as where they've been and who they've been in contact with. So we can try to figure out how they may have acquired that infection and to see who else might be at risk. Um, so we're definitely looking at um, places that they've been, where they work, um, people that they've had contact with and trying to see um, who might be at risk and notifying those people, getting those people tested. Um, if they work um, within with populations that might be vulnerable, notifying those um, employers and making sure that we're getting ahead of the infection uh, to, to stop the spread. We're hearing some um, debate about uh, the asymptomatic people who may be walking around with the coronavirus and don't know it. Is that a, a small percentage of people or a, a larger percentage than we initially thought? There is some debate about the um, infectivity that might occur with asymptomatic cases, but we definitely know for sure that it is um, possible to spread infection 
uh, while you're pre-symptomatic, meaning um, you, we generally consider people to be infectious within the 48 hour time span before they develop symptoms. So even uh, if someone is not exhibiting symptoms, um, it is still, again, important to follow all those universal precautions, including those face masks, the social distancing and all that, uh, because you could end up developing the infection um, and showing symptoms, but still that, tw that 48 hour time period before you show symptoms is still um, when you might be um, contagious to others. So we still wanna make sure that people are acting in a way that makes sure that they're, they're not spreading uh, COVID-19 to, to anyone else. So if you are, if you were to test negative for uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 and you, you, you found that, okay, I'm good, what, do you, what should you do to make sure that you stay that way? Again, if you are negative for coronavirus, um, that's great news, uh, but that's just a snapshot in time. Uh, so you want to make sure that you continue to follow all those precautions with face coverings, uh, social distancing and hand washing um, and staying home if you can um, as much as possible. Um, so that way you're limiting your contact with people who might have coronavirus. And if you do have um, an infection, limiting the number of people that you that you could expose. Well, Charles, thank you for being with us and uh, thanks for being on the front lines of this pandemic uh, and, and keeping us informed. Of course, thank you very much. And we'll be right back with more. Stay with us. This outbreak of the coronavirus is very stressful for families. Many people aren't sure where they should turn for assistance. Well, one place many people turn to in a disaster is the American Red Cross. And joining me is Dwayne Lindo, the Regional Communications Manager for the American Red Cross of Central Florida. Dwayne, thank you for being with us. Tell us a little bit about how the American Red Cross is helping people during these coronavirus times. And Clarence, uh, thanks for having us. Uh, it's very important for us to get uh, the message out uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. But what we're doing right now is uh, we're helping folks just like we have been for 100, over 100 years. Uh, if there's a local disaster, basically our disaster action team goes out and does a disaster assessment and speaks with each and every family to get a scope of how bad their, um, uh, their homes or their property was damaged. So we're able to give them uh, immediate financial assistance uh, for, them to, uh, forget, for them to get by within the next uh, day or two. But it's done a little differently now, obviously, with COVID-19. With COVID-19, basically, we have all our volunteers and staff members wearing masks when we go out to a disaster area, a local disaster area. Also, we make sure that our volunteers are, are usually six feet, six to seven feet away from folks, making sure that they play a part in doing uh, their, their due diligence in terms of social distancing. So that's another thing that volunteers are, are well trained to, to make sure that they keep not only themselves safe, but the, uh, the, uh, the person who's affected by that disaster safe as well. So what is the relationship between the American Red Cross and local governments like Orange County, for instance? Well, absolutely. So uh, between Orange County, Osceola County and Seminole County, uh, we work very closely with uh, these uh, government agencies to make sure that everyone's on the same page when it comes to congregate shelters uh, in this in this particular uh, environment, specifically the hurricane season now. Um, uh, if there is a, a hurricane uh, that happens and people are displaced, uh, local, local, basically local uh, um, uh, folks, local uh, emergency operation centers, um, local um, uh, uh, police, fire, uh, fire uh, personnel, they're usually in tune in terms of getting everyone on the same page. Now, I know Seminole County has just recently put out their 
uh, their uh, rules in terms of congregate shelters, making sure that if people are displaced during a disaster and there is uh, a, a shelter put out in Seminole County, uh, temperatures are checked, uh, screening questions for individuals that will help identify if that person needs to be in a COVID isolated shelter. So that's something they will be doing. Uh, they will be providing masks to everyone that's entering uh, the shelter. Also, reducing the amount of people that are eating in one area at one time. So uh, to make a long story short, we are working with uh, local emergency operations centers to make sure that we are all on the same page to make sure that everyone's safe. Tell us about the Virtual Family Assistance Service Center. Um, what will people find there? Well, Clarence, this is a great program which we started a couple months ago. Uh, we have a chaplain that uh, sits in Sarasota, which is part of our uh, region. We have 19 counties in our region. So Chaplain Kelvin Foster basically feels calls from folks all over the country that are um, that have go been going through grief and have lost a loved one during this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we realize that there was a need for uh, a program like this. So uh, virtual, obviously, uh, he's fielding calls virtually and on the phone. So if um, there's someone who, again, who've lo who's lost a loved one or uh, who is grieving at this time, maybe a loss of a job, or just being away from family members. Uh, this chaplain who has been in the business for 20 years, he works at uh, hospitals and he works at a local fire department. He's able to speak with these folks and empathize and sympathize with them uh, in terms of what they're going through. And I just may add as well that uh, this particular chaplain, chaplain has lost five loved ones of his own, five people in his own family uh, to tragedy. So um, he's able to empathize with the folks that he feels calls from. And again, just to reiterate, th this chaplain takes calls from all over the country. So um, he's able to speak with them, uh, connect with them, and try to help them in any way he can. And you mentioned uh, earlier the hurricane season. We've already had tornadoes here in uh, central Florida, and we're expecting uh, a more active than normal hurricane season. Um, what should people do if they are affected by severe weather in this coming hurricane season? Um, and, and how can the Red Cross help? Well, uh, technology has become such a powerful tool uh, for preparedness. Uh, the Red Cross has the emergency Red Cross app. So folks are able to uh, uh, get alerts to prepare them when storms are coming. So, I mean, the best thing you could do for the most part is obviously download, this app, download the app, but also prepare, prepare, prepare. I mean, that's one, th one thing that everyone should be doing. Also, it's just a reminder that for all of us, uh, preparedness and taking these warnings seriously is uh, very important. Well, Dwayne, thank you for all that you do and all that uh, the American Red Cross does to help those in need. Thanks for being with us. Clarence, thank you so much. And we'll be right back with more. Stay with us. We've heard from a variety of leaders today working to keep us informed about the coronavirus from local government, the medical community who's on the front lines dealing with this pandemic and organizations who continue to serve this community. We are also here to help you keep making those healthy connections. Stay safe, everyone.